Okay, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. And uh, I, I apologize for not uh, doing this in person. I just find it very hard to talk continuously um, for any length of time wearing a mask. So um, for the last uh, 10 years or so, I've been trying to understand the visual system of the, vis of the macaque monkey. The macaque visual system is very similar to that of humans, but I have worked with the macaque because people have collected a lot of data on the macaque. And um, some of you may be wondering, uh, isn't this uh, pretty far from dynamical systems? The, you know, the, my, uh, what I was originally trained to do? Uh, the answer is no, it's not. The brain is a dynamical system and um, it is one of the most fascinating that I've ever seen. Okay. So let me start with a little bit of neurobiological background. So this is obviously the face of a human rather than monkey. And so the visual information comes through the retina and your optic nerve takes it directly to what is called to this knee-like structure called the lateral geniculate nucleus. And from there, it goes directly to the back of your head to where the visual, where the visual cortex is located. Um, so the visual cortex, uh, the cerebral cortex is this very thin sheet of neural sheet that's all crinkled up and tucked underneath your skull is uh, two to four millimeters thick, much more crinkled than it shows in this picture. Otherwise they won't be able to draw anything. And the visual cortex is divided into many cortical areas, the visual, the, the uh, V1, V2, V3, V4, and so on. And I will be talking exclusively about V1, also called the primary visual cortex. So the, uh, put simply, the main function of the primary visual cortex is the identification of edges at specific spatial locations. Uh, the different cortical areas are kind of divided, uh, are responsible for different functions. Uh, V4, for example, is associated with geometric shapes and forms, V5 with motion and so on. But uh, these cortical areas are unequal. Everything goes through V1, which is the entry point to the cortex. Whatever v V1 does not see, the rest of them will not see. So V1 is far and away the largest and the most complex of these cortical areas. It's also where a lot of uh, visual capabilities are initiated, even though it cannot be completed. It initiates these capabilities, sends them downstream to be completed in the higher cortical areas. So the, the picture is that the visual information goes from the retina to LGN, to V1, to the higher cortical areas, and uh, my talk will be exclusively about LGN to V1 in this part. Okay. So a couple of other basic facts to know. One is that in V1, there are basically two distinct visual pathways. They're not completely distinct, but primarily distinct. One is called a magnal cell or power, power pathway. The other one, the parvo pathway. Uh, this one is used at low contrast. So an example of low contrast situation is when it's foggy outside. You look at the foggy situation, the contrast is very weak. And this one is very, very sensitive to contrast. So this is what you would use in, uh, in, in thick fog. Uh, the parvo pathway has more details. It needs more uh, contrast to activate it and it has color and so on. Okay, so, and I will be talking about the magno pathway, which is the simpler of the two. And so one last thing to, to, to know about this uh, overall picture is that this, this whole sheet, not just V1, but the whole sheet is divided into many layers. Okay, this is a picture of V1 under a microscope. You can see these layers, but there's a lot more uh, interlayer connections. So you can see this much thicker, darker areas. There are also interlaminar connections and also uh, connections to other regions of, uh, of the brain. So it's big sheet, one piece of it is the, is the primary visual cortex and it's all divided into layers. That's primarily the, the overall picture. Okay, so what today's topic is how cortical cells can acquire their orientation and direction selectivity. So I want to start by telling you what these two things are that, are, that is the main topic of the talk. But first, to two very basic properties about V1 neurons. The first is that they have small receptive fields, meaning that each neuron is, only has direct, received direct information from a very, from, uh, it can only see if you want, it doesn't really see, right? But it receives direct information on a very small piece of the visual field. How big? Well, um, people tend to talk about it this way. If you stretch out your arm, okay? And it's like a little bit like the, 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 the 
slightly smaller than the, the, the size of your thumbnail. Or if you look up at the moon, it's maybe like a quarter the size of the moon. That's what each neuron uh, has a, uh, information access to. Uh, that's, of course, if it's directly in your uh, direct gaze, then the periphery is different. Okay, so that's a, uh, an important fact to know that each neuron only sees a very small piece of your visual field. And the second is that there is a, something called a retinotopic map, which is a point-to-point -point map from your visual field to the retina. And I think you can, uh, you, you know what I mean by that very well. Okay, each part of your retina kind of is mapped to a point in your visual field, which is two-dimensional, by the way. Uh, but the thing is that from the retina to LGN, such a map carries over from the retina to LGN and from LGN to V1. So in both LGN and V1, there's a copy of your visual field. There's like a map, a roughly point to point map uh, of your visual field in these two areas. Okay? Now, the, it's important to know that the visual system doesn't behave like a camera. So it's, it, it doesn't take each pixel and just record exactly what is in what the information at each pixel and then just pass it on. It doesn't really do that. It kind of, uh, it, it extracts some features, it uh, enhances some, suppresses some, it modifies it. I mean, to put it uh, kind of uh, not so accurately, but more or less correct, is that it basically takes the inf signal apart and put it back together again in an incredibly efficient way. And how it does that is uh, basically the topic of interest for me. Okay, so uh, what does orientation selectivity mean? It means that each neuron in V1 has a preferred orientation, meaning that, so it has this little, it's little receptive field. If it sees a bar, so this neuron likes this 45 degree angle. So in its little receptive field, if it sees an edge that's at this angle, it would fire a lot. And if you tilt the angle away, it would fire less. If you tilt it farther away, it hardly fires at all. Okay. So each neuron has a favorite uh, orientation. And each location, of course, is represented by neurons uh, uh, that represent that have that favor all sorts of different orientations. So when you put all of that together, we can see what the edge is and what location of the visual space. And if you put the whole picture together, then you get the contours of objects. Okay. So th this is a, a very important uh, property of that. And related to OS, which uh, orientation selectivity is direction selectivity. DS, okay, and DS is refers to the ability. That, so, so th this neuron likes this uh, forty-five degree bar. But if you take this bar and move it from this way to that way, versus from that way to this way, it will strongly favor one direction and doesn't fire. And it fires a lot when it goes from one direction to the next, but not from the other direction. So that's called direction selectivity. Direction selectivity is implicated in what are called smooth pursuit eye movements. So when you have an object that moves across your visual field, something that moves across like this, and your, your eyes will lock onto that object, but that object moves. But so the way it works is that the object moves, but your brain tells your eye movement to follow that object along. And so it has to know which direction the object is doing. And this ability of the neurons to detect a direction of motion is uh, right at the core of that capability. Okay. So these are the two things I want to talk about. And so now let's, uh, I, I will in fact not talk about all of V1, but just the input layer to V1 in the magnol pathway. Okay, uh, this is called layer 4C alpha, and this is the only layer that I will be focusing on. I'm starting to uh, idealize somewhat now. I started with a more accurate uh, neurobiological picture, but now I'm starting to move to the kind of uh, uh, mathematical modeling stage. Okay, each layer can be modeled as the 2D network of neurons. It's not really 2D, but it's much, much closer to 2D than that. Than, than 3D. So you can think of it as like a 2D network, okay? It's spatially homogeneous. Not all to all coupling is actually most of the co con connections are local, but it's uh, homogeneous, meaning that if you look at one part of the neuron versus another part, uh, they look very similar, okay? And uh, so uh, in mathematical language, this is uh, translational invariance, uh, right? The, the, this is a property of the, the, the network, okay? And there are two main types of neurons, excitatory and inhibitory, uh, most of them excitatory. Uh, there's actually a lot more than two, two types of neurons, but for our purposes, this is good enough. So let me say something about the network architecture. So if the connectivity among these neurons. 
So if you take a neuron, it's, it's, it, it's connected to, it's a local circuit. So it's connected to, uh, the, uh, connected much more to nearby neurons and less farther away. It is, people usually think of that as like a truncated Gaussian, okay? And the, it looks something like this, okay? So if I take uh, an E neuron and you look at the set of presynaptic E cells, the, in other words, E cells that uh, send signals to this cell, it looks like a cloud like this. Uh, it's a truncated Gaussian denser. In the middle, it's around 15% dense, okay? And if you take an I cell, and look at all the E cells that send signals to it, it's a th thicker cloud because it's much denser, it's about 50%. And if you take another neuron here and you took an E and I cell, it's a smaller cloud because e, I, I cells have shorter axons. The, the, these, now I just wanna give you a, a sense of these numbers. They are totally unimportant for the rest of the talk. Okay. But you can see this is a fairly large network and each square here, about half a millimeter by half a meter, half a millimeter, is in a 2D layer is about 4,000 cells. So, and we've got about uh, uh, 10,000 of these squares around in our, in, our, in, our, in our visual cortex. So it's a very, very, very big dynamical system okay? and connected uh, to each other in a, in a kind of a fairly complicated but way. Okay? So, and the neurons interact dynamically by sending fixed size electrical impulses to one another. So this is an example of that one usually shows of a chemical synapse, but we're not gonna get so much into that. But the main thing is that if I use the words, this is the sender, it's called a presynaptic neuron, and the receiver is called a postsynaptic neuron. Okay? So this is the basic network architecture, and it looks very homogeneous in the whole sheet. Okay? I th think of it as a mathematician, I think of that as translational invariance. Okay? Now, what about the individual neurons? The equations that govern the individual neurons, uh, I have worked with the integrated and fire equations, which are very, very, uh, it's a very standard uh, model of, uh, uh, of individual neurons. What it does is that basically it says, let's forget about the physics, it's very complicated. I mean, neurons are very, very complicated objects. Let's forget about the physics. Let's forget about the biochemistry. Let's focus only on the electrical properties because it's the electrical properties that count when you, when you spike, when you send signals to other neurons. So doing that, we focus only on the quantity V, called the membrane potential of a neuron, okay? So the membrane potential of a neuron typically fluctuates around minus 70, minus 70 millivolts to minus 55 millivolts. I have made that zero and one, okay? And it goes up and down and it's driven by three forces. So the first one is a leak. So if nothing else happens, what happens is that this membrane potential would leak back down to zero. That's all that it, uh, it does. And the second one is the excitatory current. When it receives excitatory kicks, it tends to push it up. It drives it to this imaginary point way up here. But of course, it never really up, goes up there because by the time it reaches one, it fires a spike and then it gets reset. And it receives inhibitory spikes. It tries to drive it down here. Okay, and it does go below zero, okay? So these are the three things that affect the membrane potential. It, 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 there's a leak, excitatory currents push it up, inhibitory currents push it down, and that's really all that there is. Okay, but well, this looks like an exceedingly simple equation, but I didn't tell you what these conductances are. These are the called conductances. There are four conductances, E and I conductances for E and I neurons. So for example, the I conductance for an E cell. So every time, so the, the, this is an E cell that I'm looking at. And every time an inhibitory neuron that sends signals to it spikes, its it conductance is gonna go up for a few milliseconds. This is a few milliseconds and then it decays. Okay? But then it will get other spikes and it will pile up on top of each other. Every time it gets one, it just adds one. And then there's a coupling constant. So. But it, it only lasts several milliseconds, like maybe 10 milliseconds for I, okay? Uh, and if I look at the E neuron for E conductance, it's, it's, it's shorter, it's even shorter. It only lasts like three or four milliseconds, okay? Now, what I want to emphasize is that even though the equation looks exceedingly simple, looks like a linear equation, okay? Um, this, this, the, 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 there is really no direct control on when the spikes arrive. And when, since you don't know when the spikes arrive, there's no direct control in the firing rate. So it's the, you cannot hope to uh, solve this, e these equations exactly in close form. 
Okay, it's pretty it's pretty complicated. And this and the e spike can come from the local population. It can come from external drive and so on. So what it really looks like is that the membrane potential gets pushed up and down. Uh, in, 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 a, in what looks like a very random way because it's getting barrages of spikes. And normally it's getting barrages of spikes from other its neighboring E cells and I cells. So it fluctuates up and down. Sometimes it goes pretty high up, but nothing happens. And at this point it reaches threshold and it gets reset and it starts again. So it's very hard to predict exactly when it's going to spike. But statistically, of course, one can, uh, uh, one, one can perhaps uh, do something about it. Okay, okay so the... Uh, the parameters, the main parameters are, are, are these coupling parameters. And mathematically, this is a dynamical system. It's a large network made up of much smaller dynamical systems, uh, each one of which models a single neuron. So you don't really have to, I mean, this, the, 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 the brain really does look like this already. You don't have to you know, uh, go out of your way to turn it into a dynamical system. It is a large network of small dynamical systems. But here's something I would like to draw your attention to. And the visual cortex in particular is driven constantly by time dependent forces. What are these time dependent forces? They are the visual input, what you see, the visual external input. That's, that drives the, the visual cortex and other things like, you know, attention or other things from within your body, like you are tired or something, things like that. Okay. These things are impossible to model. So I'll be mostly focusing on that, but still is a dynamical system driven by time dependent forces. And in the theory of dynamical systems, there is no such theory. That's a, not a, not a well-developed theory in any case for such dynamical systems. Most of the work in dynamical systems uh, have focused on uh, systems that are not driven, autonomous dynamical systems. Okay? Uh, of course, that's, not, that, that's a reasonable place to start, but it's not so realistic. Because this, this is, uh, mo most, most things are connected to the outside world. Okay? And even when uh, driven dynamical systems are being studied, it tends to be periodically driven or stochastically driven. They're driven by you know, random forces that are IID and so on. But you know, in, <laughs> in, in, for the visual cortex, either your visual scene keeps changing as you look around. They are driven by time dependent forces that are very far from stationary and certainly not periodic. Okay? And I wanna mention also that because of the translational invariance and the, and the structures that are involved in the coupling and so on, there are elements of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics also, but I won't be getting into that. Okay. So, um, the, the, so, so now I want, that, that was about the, the V1, uh, which is back here. So in between the retina and V1 is LGN. So uh, I want to say a few words about the structure of LGN. LGN is relatively straightforward. Cortex is complicated, but LGN is relatively straightforward, okay? So there are basically two uh, uh, mosaics, uh, one consisting of on cells, colored here in red, and the other one of off cells, colored in blue. And the on cells are excited when they too have these little receptor fields. And the on cells are excited when they, all they can see is this little spot in your visual field. If that little spot goes from dark to light, the on cells get very happy and they start to fire. And the off cells get excited when it goes from light to dark. So they do the opposite. Okay. And the formulas are like this. If you look at the input current, input current has the, there's some kind of background, background stuff. But mostly what it is, is that this is the light intensity map. L of X is the light intensity map received by the LGN, received by retina passed to LGN. So this is the, the, the this is L. And you convolve that with a spatial and a temporal kernel. Okay. The spatial kernel is relatively simple. It's actually the difference of two Gaussians, but just think of it as a Gaussian. It's a, just think of it as just sums up the thing, thing nearby things. So think of that as just a Gaussian. So you average it a little bit near nearby. The temporal kernel is what's interesting. The temporal kernel has this shape. And what this looks like when you convolve with something like this, it means that you are taking a derivative, okay? So in other words, LGN cells are change detectors. That's why they detect the change from dark to light and from light to dark, okay? So, the, um, so uh, I think that this is, uh, this is uh, 
the the end of the my uh, the the kind of the background material. Uh, maybe good to take some questions now if people want to ask some things. Oh, I, I should say that I'm not I, I'm not keeping track of chat. So uh, please just speak up if you want to say something. Okay. Okay. So uh, if not, then I'm gonna go on to the talking about these two properties. So the point that first point I want to make is that LGN cells have no orientation selectivity or direction selectivity, and cortical cells do, even in the input layer. And there's nothing between here and here. Right, so LGN cells have no selectivity, cortical cells do, and there's nothing in between the two. So how does that happen? And this is what I would like to, 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 exp to explain. Okay, so for orientation selectivity, uh, there is the, uh, uh, the work of Hubo and Weasel, uh, the hypothesis of Hubo and Weasel hypothesis in, in the neuroscience corresponds to conjectures in mathematics. Right? Okay from the 1960s. So Hubo and Weasel, through their uh, uh, physiological experiments, uh, conjecture that each cell, is, the, the orientation selectivity comes about through the wiring, the wiring between LGN and cortex. And each V1 cell is hooked onto, is connected to either two or three rows of LGN cells. Here is one row of off, one row of on, and one row of off. So it's either two row or two rows or columns. And they are spatially aligned, pointed in some direction, and that is the direction that the cell will prefer. That is the directional preference conferred upon the V1 neuron. So this, uh, we don't know this for certain, but there's a lot of experimental evidence uh, in support of this is most likely true. Okay. Um, so then I started to try to understand, okay, so, so, so why does being connected to a row of cells, how does that help me? And then the first problem that I ran into was the first crisis in this modeling work is that, well, how, how can this happen? LGN is extremely sparse, okay? Now, if you hold up your thumb again, look at that area in your thumbnail, is represented by 10 on average, about 10 LGN cells, five on and five off. Well, that's very few cells that were responsible for such a big area. And now there are all kinds of constraints about how you cannot connect to cells that are too far away and so on. So all these constraints together, and, and then you have to not only make these uh, configurations, but kind of form them around the clock, you know, how is that really possible? And uh, so long story short is that it is more or less possible, but it looks more like this rather than like that. So the two rows of LGN cells, that this is one row of off cell and one row of on cells, and maybe this is three, okay? So it's it, because of the sparseness of LGN uh, in the Matno pathway, Pavo's a bit different, it's really not possible to form these really long rows that we had uh, imagined that it would. Uh, some people think that it's got a couple more cells than this, but uh, it's not a whole lot more. Okay. So, okay, so this is what, what this is what a connectionist looks like. Okay. So according to Hubo and Weasel, a cell that is connected to four, these four cells, so aligned, is gonna prefer the vertical direction and why. Okay. So here's how it works. Okay. Um, in, in the, a cell is optimally driven when you, people you use drifting gratings because it's very easy to measure things, it's well controlled, it's periodic. Okay? So people use drifting gratings to, a lot in uh, measurements in neuroscience. So a, a cell is optimally driven, meaning that it fires the most. When you take a, a cell that's connected to these four LGN cells, when you take a, vert, a, a gradient that's aligned with it, but not just aligned with it, but when the spatial frequency, the distance between these black white bands roughly matches the distance between these on off columns. Okay? Now, this is so that if you take a grading and, and move it through, then there will be some points when all four cells are extremely happy. Like right here is exactly turning from dark to light and right here is exactly turning from light to dark. So all four cells are very excited and they fire together. Whereas if you turn this grating 90 degrees and move it from top bottom to top, then uh, every, every one moment in time, half of the cells are happy and the other half are not, okay? So this is, seems to be the result. 
when the cell is optimally driven, so when, when it's aligned like this, the, the LGN spikes, all four of them would come bunched together. And then you will go through a period when it's not muscle excited. And then another period when it's all bunched together, all four excited, nobody's excited. Whereas if you go, turn it 90 degrees, then it will be spaced out more like this. Okay? Now, uh, in a lot of earlier models, people said that, oh, a cell is, when, it, when it's driven, when it's optimally driven, it gets more spikes. I don't think it can. Think about it, it's, it's connected to the same four LGN cells. It's the same, that, that wiring is fixed, okay? It doesn't change. No matter what grading you present, it's, it, it's still connected to the same four cells. And each cell, LGN cell, doesn't know which direction the grading is coming from, so it fires the same number of spikes. So how can the total number of spikes depend on the grading? It, it, it cannot. So, so this number of spikes here and here are the same. It's just that the patterns are different. So why do spiking patterns matter? Why is it that the spiking patterns will cause V1 to respond so strongly here and so weakly here? Okay. And there's another question that I, that, that uh, requires an explanation is the feed forward versus intracortical uh, currents. So the early thinking from the time of Hubo and Weasel, people thought that, especially in the sensory cortices that are so close to external input, most of it, the, the, the input is feed forward. So for a long, long time, people thought that 90 some percent, close to 100 percent of the currents the cell gets comes from the feed forward signal and that it gets into cortex and maybe cortex you know, changes it a little bit, but that's really what it does. But a more modern view is that it's actually the opposite. The lateral, the local and lateral within the same layer, uh, the current is much, much larger, okay? It's mostly this current really, okay? And then there's more feedback and feed forward is the weakest of them all. And there's accumulating evidence to this effect the feed forward is, is very, very weak. So for example, in the model, in our model that we work with, uh, LGN current is on the order of 10%, the intracortical uh, excitatory current, okay? So, uh, so why does so little feed forward input have such a big effect, okay? Now this whole picture that I've been painting for you sounds very uh, precarious at best. Uh, the, the whole signal comes from external and yet the current is so small just a little bit of feed forward current. And even that current is not really in the form of different numbers of spikes. It's just a slightly different patterns of spiking. Okay? Now you can imagine this is, uh, this, is, uh, um, this is vertical and this is orthogonal. In between, what, what about 22 degrees? What about 40 degrees? It's gonna be between these two, right? So the situation looks extremely precarious. Uh, how can we, uh, our detection of contours be based on something that's so, uh, it's almost scary to think about how you can do this properly, okay? So let me try to uh, uh, understand this, okay? So first, how does so little input current have such a big effect? And the observation is that if you look at a cell, it can be an E or I cell, and look, look at the input E current to it and the input I current to it, the two are very, very close to one another. They are almost equal. They only differ by a little bit, and that little bit is what determines the firing rate. I claim this, and let me give you a proof. Okay, if you look at the in integrating fire, I'm proving this, proving is using integrating fire equation. Okay, uh, it says that well, let's ignore the leak. Then firing rate, if you integrate both sides, then the left side gives you firing rate, and the right side gives you E current minus I current. If you view I current as positive. The, the magnitude of I current, okay? Now, and then you can estimate E current too. Let's say this is an E cell. You can estimate E current as well uh, by looking at the number of presynaptic cells, the firing rate of each cell assumed to be the same, the coupling weight and the distance to this reversal potential that you are pushing it towards and so on. It's very easy to see that in a reasonable model with like a, if anything is anywhere close to being physiologically reasonable, this number here, is a lot bigger than that number, okay? So if this number is a difference of two numbers, one of which is a lot bigger than it, these two must be extremely close. And this is the proof of this picture that, that I have, okay? So uh, now this is what I have just told you, is nothing more than balanced state theory uh, following Van Vriesek and Sombolinsky. Uh, they focus on 
the idea of exact balance of ENI as system size goes to infinity. And for that purpose, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, what, the, the, the theory is a little bit more complicated than that. But I want to stress that for as long as I care about approximate EI balance, I don't care about it being exactly equal, then it really just, the integrate and fire equation already tells you. So together with some reasonable circuit size, two neurons won't work, but you know, a few hundred is more than enough. Okay. Uh, so, so you have this approximate you know, balance just, come, just by looking at this equation. But it's not so much that I don't care about. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, I, in fact, want to focus on the approximate EI currents because I want to focus on the difference. Okay? So I don't want them to go to, I don't want the difference to go to zero. The current difference is a firing rate, as you can see here. Okay? So, uh, so the a consequence of this is that what we have, what I think of as an unreasonable effectiveness of external drive. Okay? So see, the, the picture is like this. You have you, to in, for the brain to send signal from one region to the next, you don't have to send very much signal. You, you don't have to send very much current. You send a little bit. It's very efficient, right? You send just a little bit of current. The thing is that the locally is balanced in such a way that a little bit of current would make all the difference in the world. And so uh, this kind of gives you some confidence that maybe a small amount of feedforward input is enough for driving this whole thing. So there's another reason for why uh, so little feedforward input is good is recurrent excitation. So in, in the monkey, and these not so, not so much the mouse, but monkey, the nearby neurons have a like orientation preference. So the, the color code is for, for the uh, orientation that it prefers. And you can see that they come together in blobs. So that means your nearby or your neighbors also prefer the same uh, 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 orientation. So they reinforce each other and that also helps. But why, so I still haven't explained, why do spiking patterns matter? It's just a slight difference in, 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 in pattern. And that's all the thing on which the whole thing is based. The same number of spikes, just a little slight difference in pattern. Well, here's a cartoon for that, okay? This is a cartoon that I drew, drawn by hand, okay? If you look at the uh, integral and fire equation, there's a leak term here, okay? So if the, if the spikes come very close to one another, it, it drives it up and then it leaks out, it drives it up and leaks, drives it up and leaks again. So it just keep, and you push it past threshold. In fact, it, you push it past threshold over and over again. And then it goes through a period when it's leaking big time, but you don't care and it's firing anyway. Okay. As opposed to uh, pushing it up and leaking most of it out, pushing it up and leaking most of it out, pushing it out, leaking most of it out again. So if, 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 the, if the spikes come, like that and then pause and then in concentration and then pause, it's really much more efficient than the ones that come uh, spaced out. Okay. So this is a cartoon explaining why, but it's still, it's a, a kind of, it's amazing to me that such a small difference in firing pattern. I mean, especially if you look at, uh, well, what about the difference between zero degree and 25 degree angle? You know, huh? uh, that's enough to cause all the difference in your determination of uh, orientation selectivity. So uh, in case you don't believe me, as proof of concept, we build the model. This is with Bob Chaplin, my Cochrane and Logan Charica. The model has, so this is just a picture that represents the uh, light intensity map that's fed to the model. The model has LGN in the input layer to V1. There's also some interaction with another piece. Let's not worry about that, okay? And this part is modeled with uh, the network structure and wiring follows neuroanatomy uh, whenever we can. Uh, of course, the information from neuroanatomy is incomplete. So th there, are, there are things that are kind of made up, but whenever we can, we follow, we, it uses dozens of sets of data, okay? Uh, because the orientation domains are like that, this is just a blown up picture of that part. We take each square and divided it up, okay? So this, <laughs> this is the math model of that, right? And divided it up into different regions of intended orientation domains. Here we have organized around these pinwheel structures. So uh, it, here we use six domains. Sometimes we use four, sometimes we use six. It doesn't seem to matter very much exactly what pattern we use, okay? But the point is that for each, for each one of these domains, uh, the fact that I marked vertical means that I'm gonna connect it to LGN two rows or three rows of 
LGN cells that are vertically aligned. And this one is connected to uh, two rows of LGN cells that are aligned like these uh, bars have indicated. So in other words, I followed the prescription of Hubo and Weasel, okay? And um, see what happens. And this is, uh, th th this is kind of like a, um, an fMRI, if you like, on a neuronal level, okay? So the color represents firing rate. Hot color is high firing. Cold color is low firing. Top row is E cells. Bottom row is I cells. So how to read these guys? So let's say this is zero. Zero means vertical in this. Thing. So for, for this, for, 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 for this, for when the, zero, when, the, when the vertical grading is presented, here's the key. You come here and you say, okay, these colored diamonds are uh, the ones with intended, in, that are intended to be, uh, to prefer vertical. Now, nobody, nobody says in order for it to really pre prefer vertical, it has to go through all this type and recognize the patterns and so on, right? So there's no guarantee that it will, but this is the intended orientation. And as you can see, the places that are firing the most really do correspond to the purple regions. And so suppose I present a 45 degree grading. Okay, so now I, I would go here and look, oh, there's no 45 degree, but uh, there, is, uh, there is a 30 and 60. So 45 must be the closest to 40, 30 and 60. So indeed, these are the regions where these uh, that are lit up the most, okay, and so on, okay. And so I want to stress again that the connections between neurons are isotropic like this, okay? So the, the connections to, uh, between neurons are isotropic. There's, there's no bias to make it uh, uh, go one way or the other. And the activity patterns result from the visual stimulus from, from ex exactly the graded that's presented together with the wiring between LGN and V1, okay? So, um, this is a little movie that Logan has made. Uh, so this is the visual stimulus when, and this is the real time in a neuronal time. And when I start the movie, if it starts, okay, this thing will drift. And then um, the, the information will be sent to LGN. LGN computes whatever it computes and sends it to cortex and the cortex will compute whatever it does. The interactions of these uh, 50,000 neurons uh, a very high dimensional dynamical system that I have no ability to control what each one is doing, but uh, it, so I send in the signal and it does what it does, okay? And if you want to check that uh, it's doing something honest, you should look at compare to grading, check here then this key to see if it's the right region that's firing and see if it's being lit up here. Okay, so here, and so, so I, I should also say that I have uh, taken some, uh, smoothing because it's very it's, it changes very violently. I don't want to give anybody an epileptic seizure, so we have uh, smoothed it out a little bit, both temporally and spatially. But in any case, here it goes: vertical grading. So what you are seeing is that because this is driven by uh, change grading, okay? so this is driven by a uh, a periodic drive and the system is in some kind of a steady state. It's in, it's in this. What you are seeing is the invariant measure of this dynamical system as seen through the firing of each pixel. Okay, so this is an, but that was a picture of the invariant measure. Of course, I cannot tell you what invariant measure looks like for uh, you know 100 dimensional dynamical system, but I can, tell you what it looks like in terms of the firing rate, but that, that's what it was, okay. Okay, so um, uh, if there are questions for orientation selectivity, before I move on to direction selectivity. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Yep. Yep. So in the, um, you had this like photo of, or diagram of uh, those sort of direction selectivity regions, and then in the, there are like these yeah, regions where things right? go around circles, and yeah. then there's these points in the middle where there's yeah. sort of no direction selectivity. Right. Is uh, it known... orient orientation selectivity? Yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Uh, is it is it known if there are, are like are there neuro like are there neurons at those middle points, and do they is it known if they do anything special? 
uh, people have taken all kinds of, uh, if you go, if you remember farther back when, with the pictures uh, that I showed you, I forgot to say that those are real imaging pictures. Yeah, that's what project. I figured. They have those things, right? They, re yeah. they really are kind of organized yeah, yeah. around some, some, some kind of pinwheel. So there are singularities there I, I i don't really know what they're for or okay. people don't seem to see them as particularly significant but maybe they, okay. they are I, I yeah just, i was just curious if there were like interesting kind of known hypotheses in the neuroscience community around that um, about singular neurons or so okay i haven't you. focused on that too much but, yeah. but i did okay so direction selectivity okay so now so, so from now on my neurons are going to prefer vertical only and uh so this for v1 cell to prefer a vertical direction um, for, for vert vertical orientation direction selectivity means that if i drift a gradient from left to right or from right to left it will respond very differently it, so this uh, we call that this this is this is a uh, this uh, capability this the, this ability of the neuron to detect the direction of motion is what enables us to track moving objects in our visual field so the uh, the existence of this uh, neurons with this ability was discovered in the 1960s, also by Hubo and Wiesel. And individual LGN cells are not directional selective. So the question again is, you know, there's nothing between LGN and cortex. How, do, uh, how come LGN cells are not direction selective and cortical cells are? Okay, so some more experimental facts is that right in the input layer, more than half of the, not all cells, but more than half of the simple cells are direction selective. And it's very far from random. The same cell will consistently prefer the same orientation. Okay, you can do it hundred times; it will prefer that same direction. Okay, and it's also not something that's very special. It's broadband in terms of the spatial frequency and temporal frequency of the grading. So it is it's fairly independent of the speed of the that you drift the grading, as well as the spatial frequency of these uh, uh, the, the 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 grading. Uh, I, I will come back to this in a moment, but it's it's a, it's broadband. Okay? So people in time over over the years have tried to explain this, and they have pointed to this idea of spatial temporal inseparability. It's kind of a little bit vague, and I'm I'm not going to. Oh, well, I will kind of come back to to this. And yeah. but the main thing is that no biological mechanisms uh, for the macaque uh, up until now have been um, uh, proposed. Uh, to, to produce this spatial temporal inseparability, okay? So this is what I'm after, the biological mechanisms that could give rise to the, the spatial temporal inseparability, which would uh, in turn give rise to direction selectivity. And I also want to do it in a realistic way, meaning that it's consistent with this kind of uh, data. Okay? So here's a proposed explanation uh, published uh, recently, is that, so, uh, the, 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 idea, the idea is that, well, first, how is, how is this uh, direction selectivity initiated? It, well, each individual LGN cells um, does not have a direction selectivity, but the claim is that the summed response of the LGN cells, so each neuron is, receives input from you know, on the order of four to six LGN cells. If you add up those LGN cells, it's already direction selective. And so the... Um, so so let me let me do a um, uh, I, I'm going to idealize the setting further. Uh, so instead of two rows uh, of LGN cells, let me just call it, make that into two uh, two cells, one off and one on. Okay, so they, they each each cell represents a row if you like, and I'm going to look at the sum of these two LGN cells. Okay, and I'm going to cheat also to saying that each uh, the response is really just this thing that was really the input. Now, I, I'm confusing input and output. It's not a terrible sin because LGN is fairly linear. So I can confuse this input with, with output without making a re really big mistake, okay? So, the, so now I, I think of the output of a cell as the light intensity map convolved with the time kernel, which I think of as a point and a space kernel. Uh, the, the, this is the time kernel. This is the space kernel, which I think of as, as kind of a point. Uh, um, and the, so now there, because it's a one-dimensional problem, there are just two gradings. It's either from left to right or from right to left, okay? And so uh, and one, one reason for making this simplification is that if you take the sine function and involve it with a reasonable kernel, what you get is a sine function, the amplitude is changed, but most importantly, it's phase shifted. 
Okay, so that means that I can think of the response of the on cell and the off cell as, and I'm not going to focus on this A for now. Let's Let's, let's focus on the phase shift. So I, I, I can think of the response of the on cell and the off cell as nothing more than the sine function of phase shifted. But they're phase shifted by a different amount because spatially they're in a different location. Okay, so here's the key to the whole thing. I want to look at the phase difference of the on cell and the off cell. Okay, uh, there's a phase difference because they are low, the, when the signal is coming, it gets here first before it goes here. So there's a phase difference. And I want to use this convention because on and off are opposite. I have to declare what I mean by you know zero. Okay, let's say that the phase difference is zero when both when the sine function max at the same point. This is what we like. We want phase difference to be zero because that way the the responses are max simultaneously, and so it must uh, to produce a much bigger uh, response. Okay, and. Uh, uh, 180 is bad, okay? So now uh, with this notation, all that I have to do is to drift the grading from right to left and look at the phase difference and drift the grading from left to right and look at the phase difference. And whichever one is closest to zero is the one that the neuron will prefer, okay? So this has got turned into a very simple math problem, okay? And easy fact, is that uh, let's ignore this uh, spatial thing uh, for now because this really is a temporal kernel that plays a big role. So if the if if the uh, the two kernels are the same, then the phase differences would be the same. It's an easy fact, and proof is symmetry. So look at this picture. If you drift the thing this way and that way, okay. If the kernels are completely identical, of course this one will lead for that one. If you drift it that way, this one will lead for this one, but the, they are the same. So I don't care about who's leading. I only care about the difference. So the difference would be the same, whether I go this way or that way. That means that direction selectivity can come only from the broken symmetry caused by the different time kernels, okay? The two time kernels have to be different and the broken symmetry is what leads to the direction selectivity. Okay, but what breaks that symmetry? And I seek, seek a biological explanation for that. And we offer the first mechanism that we offer is a time delay. Now, so I put biologic biology base in, in red because unlike you know pure mathematics, when we add a hypothesis and we get the theorem through, we can't do it here, right? It has to whatever whatever I assume has to be true, or at least have a basis, biological basis. Okay, so the first one is a time delay in the arrival of the on signal. And this is because in the circuitry in the retina, the uh, on signal and the off signals are different. The on signal have to go through some extra loop. This, this is known in neuroscience, okay? So that means that if you, uh, the, 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 so when, you, when, this, when a signal comes here, because this one is delayed, the, the distance, the time difference between the two signals is longer than uh, if there was no delay. And if you were to come this way, because this one is delayed, they would be much closer. So I've broken the symmetry and this would give rise to some direction selectivity because of this natural delay in the on, uh, uh, for on in the, in the retinal circuitry. This produces DS at high temporal frequency, but not at low temporal frequency of the grading. Meaning that, so if the signal takes about, let's say 30, 40 milliseconds before going from here to there, and the delay is it's fixed, right? so it's like no more than 10 milliseconds or so. Well, it makes a big difference, you know, 30 milliseconds at another 10, it makes a big difference. But what if it's 250 milliseconds for it to go from here to there, okay? Um, 240 and 250 doesn't make a whole lot of difference. So this property explains direction selectivity at high, higher temporal frequencies, but not at low temporal frequencies, where uh, experimentally it's known that there is direction selectivity. So it's not enough, it's not good enough. So the second mechanism that we propose was in the, in the different shapes of the on-off kernels. So playing with the data from uh, Reed and Shapley from like nearly 20 years ago, uh, I noticed that the on kernels look a little different than the off kernels sometimes, not always, but a lot of times. The, the on kernels are taller, has a part that's taller. The, 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 the negative parts are not so different, but the positive part is taller than the, uh, than the off. And I claim, that that is enough to produce a 
phase shift at low uh, temporal frequency. And here's a GD proof, which can be turned into a real proof. Okay? So think of the on kernel as being the off kernel plus an extra positive bit, this bit up there. Okay? So it's off kernel plus the positive part. Well, if this signal is a sine function, and I just showed, told you earlier that uh, convolving with the LGN kernel is like taking derivative. So the off is turns the sine into a cosine. Oh, but what does a positive part do? A positive part of a convolving with a positive thing and with a sine function gives you a sine function. So you see you're adding a sine function to a cosine function and that shifts the, that shifts the angle. Okay, so, the, so, so the, the, this, this is the, the the reason why um, we think that just having a little bit taller of a, of a, um, of a, a time kernel will, will, will have this effect. Okay, okay so the, these two mechanisms produce directional preference, but which direction? And the answer, as it turns out, is that, well, it depends on this ratio, this is the relation between these two numbers, little d, which is the difference between the on and the off. Everything projects it because of this retinal topic maps, we can project everything to the retina and measure it in terms of degrees. So, uh, so off and on is distance is d, little d apart. And if you look at the spatial period of the grading, let's call that big D. And one can prove that the preferred direction switches at these points. When little d is equal to big D over two, big D, three big D over two, two big D and so on, okay? Every half of a D over two, it switches. So trouble, um, experimental finding is that there's no switching of preferred direction for the macaque, okay? So experiments say no switching and mathematically it says that there is switching. So what happened? So here's the explanation that um, is that when you take this D to be too dense, okay? When the spatial, when, when these bands are too, 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 uh, not far enough apart, okay? Your receptive fields are unable to resolve it. So it's ten, it, in, instead of seeing these bands, it sees gray and the neuron stops responding, okay? So this is real data. This is the response, the firing rate in the uh, preferred direction. This is in the non-preferred direction in the opposite direction. As you can see that, and this is an exponential scale, as you can see that when it comes close to about five, okay, uh, the response becomes so weak and the two kind of come together and it's not so clear that there really is, the, that there really, when this is much bigger than this, the, the system is strongly direction selective, but here it's not so clear that it's selective anymore. Or if it's switch, you wouldn't know because it's all noise, okay? And this happens at about spatial frequency at about five degrees. At spatial frequency is five uh, uh, cycles per degree, that translates into big D over two is 0.1. So that means that if that little d is always less than 0.1 degree, okay? So it's always in the range between zero and big D over two. So it, in other words, it doesn't see this, then even though mathematically they're switching, uh, there would be no visible switching, okay? But is that so? And so we go to the uh, LGN cells, okay? And the fact is that the LGN cells are semi-regularly distributed, okay? People have seen those in a microscope. You can really see them, okay? They are not, uh, it, it's not a lattice. It's, it's not a rigid lattice, very far from it. In fact, you cannot, if you want to attach a lattice to it, you really cannot, okay? It, but they are fairly evenly spaced apart in the sense that they don't, or each, each of the on and off anyway, they're fairly evenly uh, spaced apart uh, with overlapping receptive fields. Yeah, the receptive fields don't sit on top of each other, uh, but, they, they, and, but they, they have a fair amount of overlap. And so uh, this is what happens if I take an on cell and off cell, if I put 0.1 degree between them and I look at, and people kind of know how big the receptive fields are, and it kind of has the, 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 it's like a Gaussian. So if I take one standard deviation of the Gaussian, they kind of more or less touch like that if I put them at 0.1 degrees apart. So I think this qualifies as with partial overlap of receptive fields. Uh, um, can, not to suggest that we got this right, but at least no contradiction so far. Okay, okay. so um, 
the some what what uh, what I have tried to convince you is that if you look at the sum feed forward LGN input uh, to a cortical cell, it already has direction selectivity. But this doesn't mean that the cortical cell themselves would have direction selectivity. Okay, the fact that its input has selectivity doesn't necessarily mean the output also has selectivity because for one thing, the intracortical currents are a lot bigger, so we can get swamped by these things. And more importantly, it is not known that the cells, the, the, half of the cells neighbors prefer each one of the two directions. See, unlike orientation selectivity, when a nearby cells prefer the same orientation, for direction selectivity, it's all mixed or so people think. So if you assume that half of the neighbors prefer one direction, half prefer the other, uh, why should the, uh, the cortical cells still have direction selectivity, even though the input does? So we go back to our trustee model. Okay. Uh, this is an, another a new paper, okay? And so DS, direction selectivity, is usually measured in terms of this quantity, pref over op, prefer firing rate over op, the opposite firing rate. So you look for its favorite grading, its favorite direction, measure the firing rate there, and divide that by the opposite, okay? Now, this is in terms of F1. F1 means the first Fourier coefficient. Uh, the, the reason for F1 is that, uh, as you recall, that the uh, orientation selectivity was not driven by mean, right? You get the same number of spikes. It's really driven by the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the first Fourier coefficient, people would like to say. So they call this, neuroscientists call this F1 driven. And so people often measure the output in terms of F, F1 also, first Fourier co co coefficient. Okay, so green here is data and black is model. So for example, if you look at three, uh, so data says that uh, about 58% of the simple cells uh, have pref over op at least three. This is a CDF, that's what, that's what it says, okay? And the model is you know, it's not perfect, but pretty good, okay? So these two lines uh, come pretty close to each other. These are for simple cells. I didn't talk about this, but so, so, so more than half of the cells uh, uh, have this ratio, three or more, which is pretty selective. Okay? Uh, these are complex cells. I didn't talk about them. Uh, the data shows the complex cells are not so direction selective. They are orientation selective, but not direction selective. And same for the model. Okay. But still, I want to get back to this one thing that there is this input, which is what I think of as feed forward DS. Okay is the DS in the feed forward input to a cell versus the DS in the response of the cell. Those two things are not exactly the same. And I'd like to uh, finish by saying some, something about this. So the worry up here was that the response may be the second one may be a lot smaller than the first. And that's what we were worried about. But the model shows it's different. It's the opposite. Cortex magnifies uh, the, the feed forward DS. So that requires an explanation. You know, half of your neighbors prefer one side, half of them prefer the other side. How come if you put it all together and it gets magnified? Okay, so this is something that really requires a mathematical explanation. And so here it goes. Okay, so this is how cortex enhances direction selectivity. And I claim that at least one way it does so. This is, I don't I certainly don't claim that this is the only reason, but this is one reason is the dynamical interaction for feed forward and intracortical currents. And this occurs completely naturally. You don't have to do anything about it. Okay. So, first point is that remember the LGN spikes come in like this. Okay. It, it's, it's packed in all the LGN cells. This is optimally driven. So, it's all the LGN cells are excited. Nobody's excited. excited like this. So this creates a kind of a periodicity, a phase in the LGN membrane potential. When the uh, LGN, uh, when, when the, uh, so, sorry, this is membrane potential of the, of the cortical neuron. So when the LGN cells come in, it's high. And when the LGN cells are blank, it's low. Okay. So it's high, low like this. Okay. And the second point is that, okay. So, so, so in other words, uh, uh, a cortical cells membrane potential is basically dictated by uh, its, L its feed forward input. The second point is that uh, the, um, the, the, if you look at the spikes that come in, uh, they don't have much of a spatial preference. They look kind of like this. The, 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 there's no spatial. The, the spikes come in completely evenly, regardless of the phase, okay? Uh, consistent with what I told you, that you know, the phases are randomly distributed and they don't 
have phases. But I claim that one and two together implies that the intracortical currents are anti-phase to LGN. And here's a proof of that. Okay, look at the I current. Okay, let's look at minus I so that I deal with positive numbers. The conductances are constant as function of phase. Okay. They, they come, there's no phase recognition, so it's constant. But if you look at V minus VI, this is V, VI is down here. Of course, it's, 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 uh, it's smallest at mid phase, which means that it's maximum, uh, minus I is maximum at mid phase, okay? So, so just, just because of that function, and this is a constant. If you look at E current, it's the same. Uh, so, so this is a constant. Now it's V E is up here minus that uh, is maximum again at mid phase. So the intracortical currents are maximum at mid phase. So when LGN uh, membrane potentials, is, when LGN current is lowest, uh, the cortical currents is exactly uh, when they peak. So what is the, uh, this, this is uh, my last slide before the summary, by the way. Okay, so I hope that's okay. Okay, uh, so this is the, so what is, what is the significance of this? The significance is that if you look at the, the fact that they are anti-phase means this. If you look at the cortical current is the uh, firing rate of LGN. Oh, well, first let's look at the feed forward DS. That's the firing rate of LGN in the preferred direction divided by the, uh, divided by the opposite direction, right? But if you look at the cortical current is LGN plus intracortical, and it's a minus here. That's what this anti-phase does, okay? So is this minus this and O minus O, okay? And if you look at the cortical currents, okay? So, so, so maybe let's look at this quantity first. For LGN uh, is the first harmonic, right? So you can think of it as the height of the amplitude of this function. So this is a preferred, looks like this. For this is for LGN only, and opposite looks like this, Oops, roughly two times. But then now this minus that, minus not plus, right? This really makes a difference. You get this and this minus that, you get that. So now this one divided by that one is a lot bigger than this one divided by that one, okay? So uh, it's really because you are taking two things and subtracting off two things that are not so different. They are a little bit different, but they are not so different, okay? Uh, if you take a, a numerator and denominator and subtracting off the same thing, you, the, the number grow, gets bigger. So what, happened, what, what, what this says is that Cortex magnifies this direction selectivity um, not by enhancing the, 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 uh, anything in the preferred direction, but by making the denominator smaller. Okay, okay. so summary okay. on the DS part. Okay. So direction selectivity, and this is the newer part of the results. The rest of the stuff is not so new. Okay. So direction selectivity is found in neurons in the input layer of V1, but not in LGN. Proposal is that it originates from the dynamical differences between the on and off LGN cells. And specifically, the two specific mechanisms that are proposed are one is the time delay of on and on, and the second is the small difference in the kernel shape, namely like this. The, direction of the, uh, the directional preference depends on the distance between the on off cells and the spatial uh, 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 period of the grading. And uh, I gave an argument to argue that it's consistent with the no switching uh, in the macaque, even though mathematically it says it is going to switch. Okay. So now we went to a model uh, consisting of like 50,000 neurons to uh, validate and to further investigate. And we found that the, the results are very close to data. And the we also found a Cortex enhances DS uh, in its feedforward input. And this is through a very dynamic, natu uh, very natural dynamic interaction of the feedforward in uh, of current interaction. Okay. It's, it's basically they have to do that. There is nothing else that it could do. Okay. And uh, I should really have put this page right at the beginning in math talks. You always talk about your co authors at the beginning, but in but in uh, neuroscience talks, this is always the last page. So these are the two neuroscientists from NYU primarily experimentalists, they provided the, uh, us with the data and a lot of guidance on, on how to assess the literature and so on. And the um, uh, Logan Charaker is a member of IES in the systems biology. And when you see a team of people working together, it's always the youngest one that gets to do all the work, right? So, and these are, uh, and uh, these are the funding agencies.
So thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Young for a, a beautiful and extremely interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for coming. Uh, we have time for some questions. I'm sure there are a lot. Lots. So, like saying, uh, this was the study of, of the macaque that you did. Is it going to be different for a mouse or a bird or a person? Um, very close to person. Uh, macaque is uh, chosen because it's very close to to to, to uh, a person. Um, for a mouse, is a has has to be different because the mouse visual cortex uh, somewhat different is much less organized than the monkeys. But there are similarities. Uh, but, when you go to the bird, mice see less well than we do, or or how how does that work? Oh, they they can't see a mouse. They can't see. They, they are really really bad. They have very <laughs> poor resolution. They can't. Okay. I mean, they it, it it's kind of like a truck running by or something like that, and they will know it. They 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 cannot resolve anything. Oh, so at so all. they have very poor visual. They have very uh, poor vision. The mouse have very yeah. poor vision. But birds would must have very good. Birds must have okay. Now those those birds are completely different. It's a really interesting species. Like they can see much better than we can, yeah. and they can. And uh, but but you know they. It's different. Birds are completely different than us. Yeah, but but you know sometimes you would, you would imagine some of the basic mechanisms were the same, but I guess they're not here. I don't know. I don't even know what the. I don't. I, I don't. I know very little about the structure of cortex. So it's mostly the mammals that look more similar. Mm -hmm. So cats quite similar to us, for example. Yeah. For example. But um, no, birds are completely different. I mean, if you go to insects, it's even more different. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, there's another big difference between mouse and us is that they don't pass so much through their through their cortex. Right? The stuff comes into the retina and it gets passed immediately uh, to the rest of the body, to to the to the superior colliculus. Uh, because you know, it's it's kind of like you know, uh, there's a predator coming that you run you know, run like mad, right? Okay, yeah. so these instincts, uh, you, you don't have time to go through the cortex and think about what should I do. <laughs> Let's see. So, so these are dynamical systems uh, which which have uh, uh, which have delay, right? I mean, these are delay systems. Well, the uh, uh, the the it's it's buried in the conductance. Okay? Yeah. Uh, when 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 it receives the spike, the conductance rises, and then the conductance will drive it. So the conductance doesn't fade for some period of time. So a few milliseconds. It has delays, is it, but not a big important? delay. Are there approximations which are which are, which are, don't have the delay or which are reasonably good or is it delay somehow essential? Uh, you, you can, uh, people who have done things like you can, uh, you, you can think of the, uh, the, the conductance as acting all at once at one point. So you give it like a little bit of time and then let it act like that. Okay? But the fact is that it does, see on, on the level of a few milliseconds, you see a big difference whether or not this delay. And on the level of like a much bigger time scale, I don't know how much difference it makes. I see. Uh, Hi, Michelle. I have a question. Hi, how are you? Yeah, thanks for yeah. the talk. It was really very illuminating. I have a question about the generality of this, uh, this kind of modeling. Uh, and specifically because we know that uh, there are many behavioral states. The brain, the, like the neurons do very different things depending on what the animal is, as a whole is doing, right? If it's just Sitting, sitting passively or engaged in a task or walking or running. And uh, so is there hope to, uh, I guess you have some data which is coming from a particular experimental condition, right? I'm, I'm assuming well, um, monkey just sitting quietly, but. Uh, yeah, a lot of the data for monkey are actually anesthetized, so they're more than sitting or quietly. Or even anesthetized. Okay, even <laughs> right, once. Right, right. So, so, so here. So I, how can I, you generalize? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. for this kind of fairly detailed modeling, uh, as opposed to kind of more phenomenological modeling, I would distinguish between the 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 two kinds of input. One is the 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 uh, the, the, the volley of information. 
information that's coming in from outside okay, that's driving the visual cortex and the other one is the, all these other things that you were talking about like i suddenly remember i have to go someplace i'm not paying attention and all these things right those things do modify the behavioral states quite a bit there's not enough understanding of that to do this kind of uh, uh, detailed modeling so uh so it's very different from the kind of work that you do when you 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 focus on these different behavioral states i'm mostly uh looking at how it responds to a body of information that comes through your visual uh, signal okay and uh, it then from from v1 it passes from it, it passes on to, i i think that it, it would be hard to to generalize beyond uh mm -hmm. that in v1 um, because it's much more subtle, right? You can't just look at V1. It goes through, it goes to the higher cortical areas, goes through your prefrontal cortex and it bounces back and forth. Mm -hmm. There's very little chance of being able to model that on this kind of level, right? So it's a really, it's a different part of the ballgame, I think. I see it. But I would imagine that even if you only go to V1, it will still behave in a different way. In the oh, if they behave in a different way. It is known that they behave in a different way. Uh, in fact, on the LGN, has, has so it, it changes. Meant, things that come back to LGN, it changes. Uh, LGN is not really feed forward, right? LGN receives a lot of feedback from the rest of the cortex. Mm -hmm. and, but the, those changes are very subtle. They are much more subtle than the things that I'm modeling. Mm. All right. Thank you. Yeah, this, this is kind of really crude mechanical behavior that mm -hmm. I'm trying to cap capture. But then there's more of a chance of kind of seeing it a little more uh, quantitatively. I, I have a question. Um, in, your, um, uh, in your model, you focused on the shape of the signal besides, rather than just the amplitude of the signal, uh, many, many firings followed by a pause followed by many firings. In digital signal processing, this is the whole game. The, the yeah. shapes of the signals have to match. Are there other situations in neurobiology where where the shape of the signal has been studied before? I I uh, I don't really know, but I know that a lot of things are actually really driven by. Uh, it, 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 it's funny that you know if you look at the earlier models of visual cortex, it's always like if you want some place to fire, then you give it more spikes. It just does that, okay. But uh, in reality, a lot of it is driven by the very, uh, very subtle things. I but I I don't I don't know the answer to your question. Well, I think it's I think it's very interesting to focus on this uh, uh, this aspect of the signals. I'm not sure any, anyone's really studied that before. It it actually really works. Uh, if you, I mean, this this is a. I think you were talking about. Uh, like really early on when I was, when. You're talking about like this one, right? right. Okay. Exactly. I mean, imagine that this is, see the thing is that we can discern angles very well, right? This is between zero and 90. So what about all the stuff in between? The patterns that are really, really close to each other. Uh, and we put that into the, the model, and as you saw in this picture, it really can dis discern all of that. So, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, so it's 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 kind of scary though. When you every time when the, when this, it's almost hard to imagine that it could work, right? But it clearly does. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have maybe a question or two if there's still time. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so maybe one question was just at the beginning because I imagine you've thought about this a lot. Um, you know, you're you said that there is you know no good theory of uh, you know high dimensional dynamical systems driven by sort of naturalistic signals, um, which you know uh, sort of is, you, you know, of course, there are vivid examples of such systems, such as, you know, maybe your model quite explicitly. Um, that's a very concrete example. But what would it even mean? Almost everything have, in the world, actually. Yeah, but what would it mean to have a theory of su such systems? Like, what are some desiderata for feeling like one has made progress beyond maybe 
the sort of most classical kind of, I mean, at this point, all this work on attractors and equilibrium right. state and stuff is extremely they, they, classical. Uh, right, but they're, they're autonomous systems, right? Yes. They, right. So, um, uh, so, so I, 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 I can tell you the two uh, thoughts that I've had on, on this. One, I'm sure that other people have tried to think about those things too. Okay, so suppose I can understand what a non-equilibrium steady state is, meaning that I drive a system. Uh, let's let let me say with some, without stationarity, we don't know how to do anything in mathematics, right? So let's say that we're driving. Well, it's kind of hard to non-stationary things. Computer so scientists say, study non-stationary things all the right, time. Right, but that's proving the main theorems. You know. Proving theorems, you know, it's yep. a not so clear what the tools are. So, so uh, I could think of it as driving with a stationary state and getting to a non-equilibrium steady state. Okay, okay. So that's half a step forward, but it's not that. Right? So one possibility is to think of think of the so these changing signals as moving from one non-equilibrium steady state to another. It's like a walk in the space of non-equilibrium steady states going from one to another. Now that requires that the moves be more discrete. So for example, with saccades, your eyes look at one direction, choose another, then it tries to go to one steady state, and then it tries to go to another steady state three times a second, so it moves like that. Okay, so that's one possibility. This type of uh, tracking is another kind, is when the, when, when, when the, uh, the signal is changing, but very slowly, slower than the speed of convergence to equilibrium. So you effectively have a continuum of non-equilibrium steady states. Okay? So these are the two ways that I can think of uh, for going forward. I've tried to do little bits of that, not very successfully so far. Uh, thank you. That's a very interesting answer. Uh, maybe my other question, it's also yeah, quick, yeah. It's sort of related to the previous discussion. Uh, there's a question of Professor Sodix about like sort of generalizing. There's this, you know, a pretty rich sort of body of recent work that sort of comes more out of like the machine learning community which is sort of intermediate in modeling approaches between this uh like incredibly biologically grounded you know mathematically careful sort of modeling of like the initial few layers of the visual system and things about like behavior in general which tries to you know ask questions about like representation learning or something so like if you compare you know if you make some sort of very general hypothesis like um do you have a representation of a 3d object or like in your in some you know incredibly non-biological model like a neural network and you can try to compare activation between that thing and some sort of some biological data and you see whether you know different classes of models tend to be more similar to biological data or not so for example this has been argued you know there is one trend about like uh sort of uh 3d structured uh neural scene representations or whatever and sort of that being more maybe kind of more similar at to sort of deeper levels to the the more kind of levels of the to sort of parts of the uh, um, to things closer to the the eye. Um, how do you think this sort of much more qualitative work fits in potentially with um, you know the sort of very fine grained modeling? Oh, I think it comes in a continuum. Uh, okay, it's not a either or thing. Uh, I'm even trying to do a little bit of that myself. But the thing is that you have to give up on some of the biological details and to to focus more on the to to, to focus more on uh, representing the phenomena. So I don't really see it as purely phenomenological or purely you know kind of mechanistic. I think of these as mechanistic models, right? I see it as a, a whole continuum that one can try to move from one uh, to the other. I, I would like to see more of that done in the future. Okay, thank you. Great. Well, uh, time's getting on. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Young for a really ex extremely interesting lecture. And um, uh, we'll uh, maybe she'll stay around for a few minutes afterwards if people want to discuss a little bit more. But thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Yeah, thank you for coming. <laughs>